I'm going to tell two stories this morning. The first is about Smart Recovery. This is an organizational story. It's a story about our organization and its approach. And we also have a personal story. It's about each of us who is affiliated with Smart Recovery, who's on a life journey that has intersected with Smart Recovery. So even before Albert Ellis, we had <laughs> Aristotle, who was a champion of reason and who said some very profound things in simple ways. In his poetics, he described what a story is. And it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And if you've ever tried to construct a beginning, a middle, and an end, you know how difficult that sometimes could be. And I want to update this slightly. I subscribe to an email newsletter from edge.org, and it's a website you might be interested in if you like to keep up with developments in the, the thought, promoted by thought leaders around the world. This particular professor, Jonathan Gottschall, uh, has written a book entitled The Way We Live Our Lives in Stories. And on his edge.org interview was a quote that I wanted to read because it struck me as um, describing something that I had vaguely realized but hadn't fully realized until I read what he said. We think of stories as wildly creative art forms, but within that creativity and that diversity, there is a lot of conformity. Stories are very predictable. No matter where you go in the world, no matter how different people seem, no matter how hard their lives are, people tell stories universally. And universally, the stories are more or less like ours, the same basic human obsessions and the same basic structure. The structure comes down to stories have a character. The character has a predicament or a problem. They're always problem focused. And the character tries to solve the problem. In its most basic terms, that's what a story is, a problem-solution narrative. So the personal story in Smart Recovery and its beginning is that an individual, one of us, shows up at a smart meeting challenged by addictive behavior and possibly not even understanding what the problem is. Certainly, there's little or no resolution in sight. And the middle the smart recovery approach begins to bring clarity to the problem and to a further comprehension of just what the problem is. Resolutions begin to emerge, but it's not yet the end. I'm going to leave you hanging for a little bit as I tell the organizational story. <clears throat> So our organizational story begins in the 1980s. The problem is that there is no substantial self-empowering, self-help, mutual help option anywhere, despite the work of Albert Ellis and the establishment of rational, rational emotive behavior therapy in the 50s. And beginning in the 80s, the application by Jack Trimpey and the development of rational recovery, he's applying REBT and creating this new organization. The situation at that time includes the existence of two other organizations, Women for Sobriety, that started about a decade before, and Secular Organizations for Sobriety, which has started a couple of years before. But it occurs in an environment in which there is almost no internet uh, capacity. The internet has been an essential component of the establishment of smart recovery. And it also occurs at a time when there's what I would call a monolithic recovery community. There is very little diversity. At that time, in the late 80s, rational recovery got some incredibly good publicity, publicity we'd still die for today. Major stories in the Boston Globe, the New York Times, and on the Today Show. As a result of all of that, we generated 14 groups. That doesn't seem to me to be a lot of groups, but it was a beginning. Now, I'm going to be going through year by year. And the few bullets that I pull are, are selective, 
and drawn from a rather complete chronology that is listed at williamwhitepapers.com uh, or .org. I've forgotten, but if you Google William White Papers, you can see among his chronologies a chronology of smart recovery. Thank you all of you who made suggestions about what today's presentation should include. I didn't get to everything, but we got a lot in. So 1991 is the first informal board meeting, and this is the group of people that I consider one group of founders. There's several ways to describe the founders of Smart Recovery, but certainly this is one group, and there are several people in this room who were at that meeting, uh, including Joe Gerstein, uh, Hank Robb, Jonathan Von Breton. This board formalizes over the next few years, which I'll describe, but it was noteworthy that this meeting in February 1991 in Dallas, Texas, at a small hotel conference room, is attended by 20 people who felt strongly enough about the potential for this movement that they flew in and stayed at their own expense, a tradition that continues with the Smart Recovery Board of Directors, um, now amounting to tens of thousands of dollars over the years for some of us. 1992 sees the actual incorporation of the nonprofit at the end of that year, but also the first published scientific paper by a New York psychiatrist named Mark Gallanter. In this paper, he, it, this is not a, an experimental study, but it's a survey study of individuals in New York City rational recovery meetings who are willing to fill out a questionnaire. And he draws the conclusions that uh, this is a fairly high socioeconomic status group. There's quite a few bachelor's degrees, master, master's degrees, some doctoral degrees. It's an educated, um, relatively sophisticated audience. Um, and he was also able to establish over time that as people stay with the group, they tend to have um, longer abstinence. So this is not causation, but it was correlation. It was the, the finding that we would want to have. So the incorporation of the nonprofit occurs at the very end of 1992, and the first official board meeting occurs in 1993, and Joe Gerstein is elected president along with some other officers. There's about 20 people there. So this is a behind the scenes organizational and foundational year, which leads to 1994 and the first crisis that the organization experiences. Now as we go through these years, I will actually talk about several crises, but this was the first one. And the crisis was that the board had come together, mostly mental health professionals from around the country, not yet international, but from around the United States, has come together with a vision of a science-based, probably primarily cognitive behavioral uh, mutual help group. Motivational interviewing isn't on the scene yet. Mindfulness is hardly on the scene. And this is the direction the board wants to go in. And Jack Trimpey is evolving his own thought about what rational recovery should look like. And those two directions started to diverge. The simplest solution from the perspective of the board was to part company. Now there's a lot longer story than that that goes with it, but uh, in simple terms, the board decided to change its name to end its licensing agreement with Jack Trimpey and to move forward initially as a dash in the Alcohol and Drug Abuse Self-Help Network which in October 1994 was changed to Smart Recovery. And that's the name we have operated by ever since, but our legal name actually continues as a Dashen, Alcohol and Drug Abuse Self-Help Network. Once we had the name Smart, we also figured out that it made a really cool acronym, but <laughs> the name came first. <clears throat> Now, as I think I may never tire of saying, I don't think that smart recovery would exist um, except for the work of two people. The founder, uh, if we're going to pick just one, 
is Joe Gerstein, because the leadership that he exerted at that time held this group together. There's a story um, of the man, I'm blanking on his name now, who, who led his four uh, lifeboats full of survivors off of Antarctica, and he stood in front of his, the lead lifeboat for like 90 hours just so his crew could see that there was someone leading things. And that was my sense of Joe during this time. And once that first year resolved itself, we knew we had an organization, and we knew we would move forward. We also, at that time, picked up Sherry Allwood by a, a series of circumstances. Originally, she wasn't directly employed by us, but was employed via someone else that we had a contract with to provide our administration. And <clears throat> I personally thought it was such a foolish idea that we would even be in a position to hire anybody at all. I neglected to go to the interview. Uh, because I just couldn't imagine how we could possibly get anyone competent to work for this organization that hardly even existed. So four of the five search committee went to Chicago and I stayed home in San Diego thinking this is just a waste of money. Um, and so Sherry Allwood is the second reason I think that we exist today because she has been the glue that has held this organization together. And I bet that nearly every person in this room thinks of yourself as having a personal relationship with Sherry Allwood, and you do, because she cares about everybody who's here. <clears throat> and as part of that glue, she got the newsletter started that year, a newsletter that continues. So in just these first few years, what have we seen? There is broad support for the notion, the general idea of smart recovery. When certain key tasks were needed, dedicated individuals stepped up and accomplished those tasks. There is a professional and scientific foundation for this organization and there remains a connection between the scientific community and the professional community and smart recovery and it is one of the foundations uh, for this organization. And this organization can survive a crisis, which is a good thing because that will be demonstrated again. For the purposes of future podcasts, I have been instructed to pause from time to time. <clears throat> We're doing okay, Eddie? So, let's pick up with 1995. We establish our purposes and methods statement, which on two pages summarizes what this organization is about. We discussed, might say wrangled over that document for months and months, finally hammered out something that we thought worked. It has been almost unchanged over 20 years. We have an affiliated website, which begins at that time and Within a couple of years, we're up to 90 meetings. A milestone in 1996, we get our first external funding. Not a grant application. Joe Gerstein picks up the phone, makes a phone call, and $50,000 from Robert Wood Johnson Foundation shows up to fund six training events in cities around the United States we now have trained dozens and dozens of people around the country. We put together a listserv to help hold these individuals together and we put out our first reading list. Now the reading list is now rather out of date, which is bad news in one way, but actually good news in another. There are so many books about self-empowering recovery now that it's just impossible to keep up with them all. So we still have the old war horses there on that list and they're still good books. Uh, there are more recent publications if you want to find them, but we just got swamped with, with keeping up with all of them. In 97, we see further developments in organizational infrastructure. A code of conduct. We realize with running mutual help meetings, there is a responsibility that each facilitator needs to hold up to and we need to be clear about delineating 
what does this job entail? What can you do? What should you not do? And that code of conduct summarizes that. The Arizona prison system adopts smart recovery. And that's a major step forward and leads the way, as you'll see, we have connections then with correctional institutions around the world as time goes by. And Inside Out is one of the ways that that happened. So there are a variety of funding mechanisms in the United States federal government. And an outside organization, Inflection, with Smart Recovery's assistance, submitted a grant application to the Small Business Innovation Research uh, Grant Mechanism. If you want to make a lot of money, that is a way to do it. We didn't see a lot of it, but Inflection did pretty well with this. And they did produce this program called Inside Out, which is designed for use in a correctional, as in prison system, or affiliated uh, types of settings. And in addition to describing smart recovery in detail, it presents uh, an entire segment on criminal thinking errors, which is useful for that population. So the, in 97, the grant is submitted. In 97, we also establish our own website, which lays the foundation for uh, quite a bit that follows. And in 98, we established there on the website message board and online meetings. We moved to annual trainings. We had done the six regional conferences with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. But it's time to start annual trainings. We put together an international advisory committee, largely mental health professionals at that time, but a few other individuals. It's about. Uh, we're pushing 20 individuals currently. Many of these participants have been on that committee since it was established. And for years, we had been trying to decide how to spell our name. <laughs> and so the periods came in and out, and there were different in some places and out others. And the board took what they decided was a final, final vote on the issue, and we ended up well, as Joe Gerstein said at the end of the meeting, we're done with the periods, period. <laughs> In 99, what started as, quote, cheat sheets, unquote, became the smart recovery tools over time. I think most of us are familiar with and probably comfortable with the idea of a cheat sheet, but we thought about it a while and realized that the underlying concept probably wasn't what we meant. Uh, we weren't cheating. We were actually forging ahead. And I will come to the tools in a little bit. But this, uh, as nearly as we can tell, is uh, when the tools began to emerge. So recognize that for about five years, Smart Recovery is operating with a rudimentary handbook, an online presence, and no very clear delineation of specific tools. You picked things up as you went along as to how to do this approach. In this year, we are also recognized in a publication by the National Institute on Drug Abuse, which is the Principles of Drug Addiction Treatment, in one of those vagaries of politics, which I cannot explain. This publication, published in 1999, lists, it says something like, it was around page 20, the, the book is devoted to treatment and the importance of treatment, which makes sense given where it's coming from, but then mentions that individuals may also wish to attend a mutual help group such as Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, or Smart Recovery. Now, they didn't get the, the, smelling, uh, the spelling correct. It was capital S and all lowercase after that. But it was a big start, and we started putting it on the website that we've been recognized by this organization, and many other organizations follow this one. So we are now a widely recognized organization that's different than endorsed. Endorsed might be a little strong, but we are certainly, when people mention us, we, I think we can say that we're recognized by the Office of National Drug Control Policy. Um, so that was uh, a beginning for this kind of recognition. But the, the vagary is that when the next edition of this Principles of Drug Addiction Treatment comes out, 
AA and NA are still in it and smart recovery is somehow gone. And I investigated that to the extent I could by making contacts within NIDA and no one could explain it to me. So I have some theories about why that might have happened, but I'm working on getting us back into the addition after this one. And human beings, primates that we are, have trouble communicating when we don't get face-to-face -face contact with people. So this is the beginning of the recognition that online communication is fraught with difficulties and we put an advisor in place to begin to help with our online experience. In 2000, we begin an active outreach to non-recovering, thank you very much, mutual help at its best. So this is one thing that makes this organization unique. Think about it. If you were just John Q or Sally Q Public and you wanted to do something about promoting addiction recovery in your locality, and you wanted to do something more than just give money, you wanted to actually be involved, where would you go? Smart recovery may be the only place that a non-recovering person is welcome to donate his or her time and effort. Any place will take your money, and that's fine. We'll take your money too, by the way. Uh, but we are a place where you can donate time and effort, and we'd love to have you do it, whoever you may be. Our need for training has increased at this point um, so that Mickler Bishop from New York City begins monthly trainings. This is a big step forward. And Joe Gerstein on his second visit to Scotland manages to start the first SMART meeting. So I'd often thought of Joe Gerstein as the Johnny Appleseed of SMART recovery because he's done this in uh, Australia, South Africa, Uzbekistan, places I probably don't remember at this point by coincidence. I'm investigating National Geographic last night. It turns out that yesterday was Johnny Appleseed's 240th birthday. <laughs> and he's on the National Geographic website as, as today in history. But there's an interesting twist to the story because um, <coughs> what you remember him for and what he actually accomplished is a little bit different probably. He planted apple trees in the frontier, the western frontier, which was Pennsylvania, Ohio, and Indiana at the time. And one historian described him as a shrewd real estate investor who ended up with 1,200 acres of orchards and a fairly wealthy uh, uh, set of net assets by the time he died, even though he lived simply. And the apples that grew on these trees were not very tasty, but they were perfect for making hard cider. <laughs> so the historian said that, in fact, what he had done was give the gift of alcohol to the western frontier. <laughs> I don't think that's the gift that Joe had in mind, uh, but he gave the gift of recovery to many countries around the world. Also, on January 1st, 2000, uh, a potential thorn in our side was removed when Rational Recovery decided that it was no longer offering groups. Although in fact, the organizations had completely split and there really didn't seem to be much rivalry. There was always this potential that it might occur and when Rational Recovery stopped offering groups altogether, then we were in completely different businesses and that was a, a kind of relief. So what do we see over these few years. We've got the correctional system involvement. We've got grant funding. It's coming in from multiple sources now. Smart Recovery Online is taking off. We have a focus on training. And we see the ongoing evolution of the Smart Recovery approach, that this is an organization that was not carved into stone in 1994 and will remain unchanged ever after. In fact, this organization uh, evolves as the science evolves. Now, as it turns out, the science may not be evolving very fast. 
in a fundamental way and we have to look at how the science would actually apply in a mutual help group and what would be self empowering this is really what smart recovery is about is the intersection of these three factors is it science based is it self empowering does it work in a mutual help organization so that will change a little bit slower than just the science itself but we do change and keep up with that Did I mention that we had some crises? Yes. So I'm not sure it was exactly this year, sometime maybe in the late 90s or around 2001. Money was getting very tight. And we received what was at the time an anonymous donation of $40,000 that uh, probably made the difference <clears throat> between uh, continuing to thrive or possibly going out of existence. It was anonymous at the time, but when John Boren resigned from the organization's board, he allowed me um, the right to mention that he was in fact this donor, and uh, it was a crucial donation at a crucial time, so thank you, John. And Joe, uh, because of his previous efforts, has now been invited as a keynote speaker at the Scottish Prison Conference, and that continued to promote um, smart recovery in the Scottish prison system and in the UK generally. Five years after the grant application was submitted, the Inside Out uh, program is published and we begin bi-monthly online training. So this is now beyond phone training, we're into online training. In 2003, another major event occurs, which is an anonymous contribution which remains anonymous. And this completely reorganized uh, this organization. We made the, call it strategic decision, that we would not take this as an endowment and just spend the interest, that we would spend this money as strategically as possible and see the development of smart recovery as widely as we could. At the same time, we got a $50,000 grant from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration of the federal government to produce training videos, and many of you have seen these videos. We've produced a whole set of them, uh, which have continued to be useful. And this process of being translated into multiple languages takes a big jump forward in 2003. By 2004, the handbook, which had had several attempts at being uh, at coming into a second edition was uh, with a new editor, Henry Steinberger, brought to fruition and we have the second edition of the handbook in time for the 10th anniversary which we celebrated in Phoenix. Um, a major step forward for us because everything comes together in that handbook. We also have major developments in Australia and Scotland that year and another big study, again funded by the federal government by uh, the Walsh Group that looked at individuals in a number of so-called alternative mutual help groups, Women for Sobriety, SOS, Smart Recovery. The term alternative, by the way, seems to be phasing out of existence. Uh, I, I still use it from time to time, but we no longer need to think of ourselves as uh, we are an alternative because there are many, as Director Botticelli said, there are many approaches to recovery. We are one, one among many. Uh, one equal among other equals. This particular study found that uh, people in all of these groups appeared to do better uh, in, along with attending these meetings. And smart recovery in particular worked regardless of someone's particular spiritual or, or a, spiritual or religious orientation, which is exactly what we wanted it to be. I'll come back to that theme in a moment but almost regardless of what your ultimate beliefs or values would be, the tools of smart recovery could be useful to you. So I'm standing in front of the flags of all of the nations which are represented in person here today. And as the years go by, we hope to hold this conference around the world, and we hope to have a whole stage full of flags 
on that National Geographic website, uh, I discovered that this organization is founded in 1988, and it's now 126 years old. So I began thinking about smart recovery in 106 years. We won't be here to see it, but wouldn't it be glorious to have a building like this and to have the reach of an organization like this? There are 420 magazine covers out in, I didn't count them, I just multiplied, uh, covering 35 years with a little division, you can calculate that, uh, 35 years of magazine covers. And you can imagine the work of the thousands of people that went into making those covers and uh, promoting knowledge of the world that this organization does. So yes, in our little way in 2005, we begin these licensing agreements we got some presentations at major conferences. Joe got to the National Drug Court Institute along with some other people. We got funding for a teen handbook and we're up to 255 smart meetings. We established in 2006 facilitator distance training which um, has now been going monthly for a long time. That small business innovation research grant mechanism this time goes to Reed Hester who develops Overcoming Addictions, which became available online a year ago and has now become a source of recovery for people who only want to do something completely private. It's also become a small revenue stream for smart recovery. And <clears throat> I mentioned we had crises from time to time. Uh, we established a part-time director for smart recovery online to make sure that that community functioned at its highest possible level. Themes during this period of time, continued international expansion. We're having both our own publications and scientific publications about us. We're continuing to develop organizational um, infrastructure and we're getting recognized and online activities are increasingly important in this organization. A major federal circuit court decision in 2007, followed by some additional ones, put some teeth into the reality that the government should not require someone to attend any particular kind of uh, mutual help group. What we're really aiming for is to get the government out of treatment altogether and mutual help so that no one is required to attend treatment or a mutual help group. We may have a ways to go there, but we're making progress. We get a free Google AdWords campaign which continues, which is a significant source of uh, publicity for us. And we realize that the annual training is not an efficient way to train people, so we just revert to having an annual conference such as this one. We begin the annual participant surveys in 2008. Did I mention that Smart Recovery had crises? <laughs> so this one was about the foundation of this organization. Is this a partnership between peers and professionals or is this a peer-led organization only? I have always believed that we have strength in diversity and that we need professionals, peers, non-recovering individuals and other stakeholders and after a year of intense discussion on this issue, we came back to that original foundation of this partnership across all of these groups. We're up to 466 smart recovery meetings, and that year we hold our first strate strategic planning meeting. So you've seen businesses that produce vision, values, mission statements, and they often look kind of mystifying. So I, I'm, in just a quick second here, I want to demystify these. If you were a newspaper reporter, in the opening sentence of your story, you should be answering these questions, who, what, when, where, why, and how. So for instance, <clears throat> if the Washington Post reporter, is there a Washington Post reporter here today? <clears throat> Maybe not. Uh, we would say that Smart Recovery uh, held its annual conference on, uh, to celebrate its 20th anniversary on September 26, 27th, and 28th, uh, 2014 at the National Geographic headquarters in Washington, D.C. for the purpose of uh, 
gathering together, supporting one another, learning more about Smart Recovery's past as, and preparing for its future by having speaker meetings, conversations, social events, dinner meetings, and uh, social activities. My editor would probably want me to shorten that, <clears throat> but that would be a complete answer to all of those questions. So when you're doing a mission, vision, values, purpose statement for the organization, you only really need to, to answer a few of these directly. And we said, this is why we exist. To help individuals gain independence from addictive behavior and lead meaningful and satisfying lives, and as a secondary purpose to support the availability of choices in recovery. What we do, <clears throat> we offer free, no fee, self-empowering, science-based, face-to-face and online support meetings for abstaining from any substance or activity addiction. And vision isn't in that original list, it's, it's a look to the future and that's what we want our future to be. 2009, we began accepting sponsorships uh, on the website and for the conference. We appoint regional coordinators, social media begins. 2010, online family and friends begins using both the tools and craft, which is community reinforcement and family training. This is a major development in smart recovery currently with about 30 meetings altogether worldwide. This is reach to a new audience. Until now, we have simply supported individuals who wanted to recover themselves. Now we're reaching out to their family and friends, their support networks. It is conceivable to me that family and friends will become a larger component of smart recovery than the original meetings because as, as most people will tell you, right before someone enters recovery, there's three, four, five, maybe 10 people who, uh, who want to know that this person might uh, make changes and are willing to do something about it. We issue a statement that smart recovery will help you regardless of whether you view addiction as a disease and that we view the power to change as something that resides in you, not outside of you. I mentioned crises. So 2003, we had all that money. We slowly spent it down. By 2008, income had dropped substantially. We pulled ourselves together financially. By 2010, we're starting to put money back in the bank. 2011, we passed the hat as well as passed the brochure in meetings using our own participants as sources of advocacy for us in the community. Smart UK develops the partnership model. We're up to 667 meetings. 2012, first online meeting in Chinese. Online registrations over 1,000 per month. Charlie Atwater develops website landing pages for specific addictions, which is often what people are searching for online. Face-to-face -face family and friends gets established. The first Gerstein Award goes to Dee Cloward last year. We surpass a million visitors per year. We're over 1,000 meetings. This year, as of a few days ago, 1,311 meetings. We've got a lot of organizational infrastructure in place. We are not a startup anymore, but we're still less than 1% of the total market. I'll come back to that. The idea of smart recovery is actually bigger than the organization itself. This is a good thing. It gives us something to grow into. In the last two years, publicity is now something that comes to us. We don't we certainly seek it out, but we don't need to seek it out as much. We have a major role for us in sight, and this has been the work of thousands of people, and it will soon be the work of tens of thousands. So to quickly run through the approach, to me, this is the heart of smart recovery. Discover the power of choice. The implication of this is that I have the capacity to make choices, and I have the capacity to stick with them. The four-point program in its revised language of 2011, th these are not steps, but these are all the issues that we cover, and the tools all fall under these. Ten tools at present, they probably will change, but they cover, I'll just run through them in order, I'll change what I'm motivated to change, 
I'll need to make some plans to do that probably by small steps. I need to know both cost and benefits. I need to figure out what I'll be replacing. My thinking might be distorted and I need to look at it and consider some new ways to think and around urges or cravings in particular, I need to understand that urges are time limited, that they will not force me to do anything and they do not harm me. Destructive imagery and self-talk awareness and refusal method disarm is a tool for challenging the thoughts or the images that might pop into mind by personifying some counter warrior who attacks them. Not everybody likes this one, but it's very useful for some people to recognize that I have values and that I want to live a life guided by my values. When in a meeting, I might benefit from the brainstorming ideas of others, and in a meeting, I might benefit from practicing what I need to say to others because interpersonal relationships are a crucial part of recovery and I need to do my part well, and I need to accept myself as I am. When people are in early recovery, they're at that stage where they can resist anything but temptation, and they're willing to do anything that it, that it will take to give up drinking problems, except give up drinking. <laughs> and, and they're convinced that um, they don't know exactly what's wrong, but there's this sneaking suspicion that I'm what's wrong, that I myself am somehow a mistake, a misfortune, and to counter that, to recognize that I have as much right to be in the world as anybody else. So the last part is our discussion meetings. And in three words, I would say our meetings are about doing smart recovery. Follow the agenda, focus on the, the slogan, choice, the points, the tools, don't give advice, don't allow monologues, don't go off topic, that's a smart recovery meeting. So to update the organizational story, smart recovery is widely recognized now, so widely recognized that our problem has changed. The burden is now on us to be widely available. It's not about struggling anymore for recognition. Now we have an organizational mission to accomplish. And let's recap the personal story. To remind you, this was each of us affiliated with SMART on a life journey, challenged, not sure exactly what the problem is, but as we engage in SMART, we get some clarity, resolve some of our challenges, I propose that the end includes our own personal definition of recovery. Perhaps the term even becomes irrelevant and I just lead a satisfying life. And I've come to have a new sense about my mistakes. Despite my errors, the trauma I've experienced and the deprivations that I have experienced, what am I uniquely qualified to do? Why am I fit? How am I fit? Perhaps it's only reaching to certain specific people, but I am uniquely qualified to do something. So rather than being filled with self-doubt, self-criticism, pessimism, and feeling isolated, I view myself as respectable and respected, liked and lovable, uh, and loved, as someone capable of making a contribution and following the rules that are important to me. We get to choose the rules we follow. We have to live with the consequences of not following them. Uh, others' rules, but uh, we get to choose quite a bit. So I would suggest that the end for each of us is that by understanding my own story, I can complete my own story. And for smart recovery, if we can have enough quality meetings around the world that we are comparably available, sufficiently available, then we can help millions of people understand and complete their own stories, making the world a better place for them and for all of us. Thank you.